So thanks everyone for joining us today for Special Education Thursday, our webinar. Today we're talking about what is a school social worker and um, how they, they do work in special education. Um, we've got a guest today who's one of my favorite social workers around, and I'll introduce her in a minute, but first I just wanted to give you the um, what we're doing here. Um, my name is Molly Whalen, and I'm the Director of Parent Engagement at the Advocates for Justice in Education. And AJE is the federally designated Parent Training and Information Center for Washington, D.C. around special education and disability awareness. So we began um, Special Education Thursday webinars a few months ago and basically will not keep you any longer than 30 minutes. And what we try to do is a little bite-sized part of special education to learn a little bit more. We keep our questions and our focus very parent-centric. This is not um, a heavy webinar at all. You can follow along online, but most of our conversation is on um, voice and on the phone. And also we will put the recording on our website. So if you're ever interested to see um, previous recordings or listen to previous recordings, please go to aje-dc.org and you can um, see a, a bunch of different little things about special education. So without further ado, let me welcome my guest, Lindsay Damon, who is a school social worker at Capital City Public Charter School, which is a public charter school in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to welcome Lindsay and ask her to tell us a little bit about her background and her work in the field of social work and special education. Hi, Molly. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Okay, so again, my name is Lindsay Damon. I am a licensed clinical social worker in Washington, D.C., um, and I have been at Capital City for, um, this is my fifth school year here, um, and it is a wonderful school. It's got all kinds of different programs, and I'm happy to kind of share a little bit more about that when I get into to my various role here. Um, but at Capital, I'm sorry, so, so before at Capital City, I have, um, I worked in several different uh, areas, all kind of focused on education since I, since I got my background. Um, I'm sorry, since I got my degree. I have focused with middle schoolers for the most part, so kids who are between um, 10 years old and 15, 16 years old. Um, but in my training at school, I um, definitely got a lot of work you know, across, the, across the ages, um, everywhere from babies and prenatal care all the way up to aging and end-of-life care. So um, when you go to social work school, um, I attended Syracuse University, got my master's there, um, and when you go to social work school, it's kind of cool because you get to take classes and you get to um, really get a broad picture of, of what's going on and what the kind of various needs are in the community, in the world, in, in certain families um, to so that you can make an educated decision about where your passion lies. Um, and just given my background, given my history, it, it was pretty clear to me um, right away that, that I and I loved and I was I had strength in working with um, teens and preteens. So that is, um, you know, the basic of, of where I came from. I have worked in various schools in Washington, D.C. for about eight years, um, including um, a program at one point that was for students who had serious behavior issues. It was a, a, a program in Montgomery County where um, students were pulled out because of um, because they were not able to function in the class. The goal was to get them reintegrated again, um, but that experience in particular really framed my work and um, my um, direction that I that I focus on at Capital City. So let me ask you this, um, just to kind of give the framework, as, as people who know that when we do social, especially Thursday, we try to get this in the mindset of a parent of a child who may have a disability or may be getting special education services. So how do you, you're not a teacher, right? So how do you work within the school building um, with either other teachers or the classroom or students? What does that okay. look like? Well, let me start out by saying that um, sometimes when people hear social work, hear the word social work or hear about a social worker um, related to their child having any kind of influence in their child's life, they they panic um, because they okay. parents often hear social worker and they feel like that's the person who's going to take the child out of their home or that's the person who's going to, you know, report them to authorities for, you know, for some kind of thing. That is that is such a small part of of a role of a social worker, and it's not a part of the role of the school social worker at all. 
you know, a school social worker has no control over whether or not a student, you know, stays in a home, whether, what kind of setting is, is the best one for a student. So let me start by saying that, you know, don't be afraid of, of your school social worker. <laughs> that, that is something I would like to, to emphasize. Um, and parents should know that, um, you know, at various different schools, school social workers can have different roles, um, ranging from being, you know, a, a basic counselor, someone who students meet with on a regular basis, all the way up to just focusing on um, college and focusing on getting kids into college, looking for scholarships. Um, in my role at Capital City, and I think where where the the profession is going, especially in D.C., is that a school social worker would take on a pretty comprehensive approach to student family needs um, for students who are both in special education or receiving, you know, an IEP or a 504 plan, and for students who are in general education. Um, so it's not only having those individual um, group sessions with or, or group sessions with those students, it's about um, really serving the families too, getting um, families connected with resources. Um, mm. And so there's there's a big, and I'm happy to you know share a little bit more about that as we get to it in the conversation. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I would I would say that parents should know that you know the role of a social worker and why I really love this job and this profession is because it is comprehensive and because you get to be part of so many different pieces of, of a school's puzzle. Um, whereas there's, I, I don't know if this is a conversation we can have down the road, Molly, but um, you'll, you'll hear of school counselors, you'll hear of school psychologists, and those two different roles have very, 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 um, you know, single track um, points of view. Counselors only meet with kids all day, like all day long psychologists do assessments with kids all day long, whereas I get to kind of focus on a more broad um, broad way to support our school community. So. Yeah, and, and so I think that's really a key piece to, you know, talking, and I'm so glad that you brought it up about parents not being fearful of this. In fact, I, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the school social worker is frequently one of those people that a parent could go to beyond a teacher or beyond the special aid coordinator or beyond an administrator when they feel there may be some emotional concerns for their child, right? I mean, that's a resource for them and may even like maybe if they feel like, oh, the student is really not getting along with a teacher or they're just really not eye to eye, a social, a school social worker would be a terrific resource for a parent to go to to talk out a problem, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and we can offer some insight on um, ways that they can get their needs met or their child's need met in the school. Um, and, you know, just like it works with the kids, everything a parent could talk to, could would talk to, um, you know, stays confidential, of course, unless we need to, you know, take it to an administrator. Um, but, yeah, I, I am definitely a person who, who helps with mediation, with, you know, again, connecting with resources, with really helping parents to get their child's needs met, regardless of what that need looks like at school. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that in your role, and, and I know you're speaking to maybe your capital city role now, but in most schools you work in, that you're kind of the connect the dot person um, because you're working with teachers and the students and maybe the administrators and maybe the families, that you're kind of the spoke of the wheel or the center of the wheel? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a really great way to describe it. You know, I end up, um, you know, people people often will often come, will often come up, whether it's a teacher, a parent, our administrators, um, you know, even a student themselves and say, you know, here is what I need, how can I get it? Um, and then I tend to be the person who, who would refer them to the right place, take care of it, um, you know, just depending on what it is. And, and those things look really different, you know, where, where those problems might end up going can look really different. Sometimes it's a behavior issue that needs to go to, you know, an administrator. Sometimes it is an academic concern that can be addressed with the teacher. So, um, a big part of the job is actually um, looking at a process called response to intervention um, uh -huh. and just figuring out what it is, what programs can be put in place, um, in theory, in the short term, to help to solve any kind of concern that a student or a parent or a teacher or anyone in the community has. Yeah. And is that, would you mind, I mean, I, I, we didn't have this on the agenda, but you brought it up so eloquently about it. I think people hear response to intervention or RTI a lot, but may not understand exactly what it is. Do you feel comfortable kind of maybe giving a little synopsis or description of how that works in school? Yeah. 
Um, so it, it looks different in every school. Um, you know, traditional RTI requires a pretty serious commitment from you know everybody in the everybody in the school community that you know is a is a firm system of rewards consequences um, to to create standards for behavior and make sure that everyone's clear on, on I'm sorry for behavior and for uh, you know academic concerns to make sure everyone's on the same page and, and everybody is getting. Um, the support that they need at their specific level. So what RTI allows for is looking at um, the fact that students come in with needs all across the board. Some students just are really low in math. Some students, you know, need help with reading. Some students need help with focus. And it really meets each individual student where they are um, and offers supports and interventions in those places um, through a system of, of rewards and consequences to help with um, to help solve those problems, to help get there, um, you will yeah, hear RTI. You'll hear no, RTI. Ahead. You'll hear RTI as as um, as a system of tier two interventions. That's often where you'll how you'll hear it described. So you know, tier one is the stuff that happens in a general education classroom. Tier two is stuff that would happen with these more specialized um, implementations of, of rewards and consequences. Tier three is when you get to a more closely monitored. Um, special education or 504 plan process that could be a formal behavior intervention plan, um, stuff that's monitored legally by a case manager too. Yeah. And then, so tell me about, like, you know, when you say response to intervention and there may be a concern there, like what types of students do you work with? I mean, I know you're in middle school, so you kind of have that age group, but like describe how, you know, wh why you would be start working with a student or what, what would be the different scenarios that you'd be working with students or for students? Um, so like I said, I, I, I work with both general education and special education students here. Um, general education students, you know, can come for any reason at any point in time. So maybe there's a divorce in the family. Maybe they're just dealing with anxiety. Uh -huh. and this park is coming up. Maybe it's a student who's dealing with some low self-esteem. Um, maybe it's a okay. student who's starting to make some, some scary choices socially and they just need someone to kind of help them get back on track. Um, so that is stuff that you frequently see with this age group, I'm sure, as many parents yeah. uh, have experienced. Um, well, I would, I would think, Lindsay, that if you describe it that way, you may be working with the entire middle school class. <laughs> Well, so I, I would say that another, you know, this is maybe another conversation, but, you know, another part of my role here is, is to provide prevention education and to provide uh -huh. these more, like, big picture general education supports, whether that's, you know, in a, in a class at, at our school, um, the advisory, you know, small group period is called CREW. And so during okay. CREW, that's a to push into groups and then work on some of those social emotional skills. So, so a good a, a good setup within a school is the social workers are doing proactive programming in addition to reactive programming. Would that be fair exactly. to say? Exactly, exactly. Um, the other you know batch of students, the other way we can categorize it is the students with special education plans with IEPs, um, and those students who have IEPs, particularly with middle schoolers. The kids on my caseload, you know, have a range of disability categories. So some of them have, you know, the typical emotional disturbance where you would assume a child gets counseling if they are labeled as having an emotional disturbance because of depression, conduct disorder, opposition, anxiety, any of those, um, you know, those emotional needs. However, I see students who have visual impairments. I see students who have learning disabilities. Because in middle school, those challenges um, and their impact on their emotional and social and behavioral um, functioning impedes their ability to access and make progress in, in a regular classroom. So counseling for IEP kids is not just about kids who are labeled as having, you know, emotional issues. It, it's kind of for yeah. a range of kids that just need that support. Yeah, and so I think that's really a key piece. I mean, I probably didn't even realize, you know, in the individual piece that a student doesn't have to have an IEP with social work hours for you to be working with them, that it could be, a, you know, those different um, levels or needs and coming in and coming out. So what would you, you know, I would say also, 
when you work with a student, let's say, in a more informal way, so it's not part of an IEP and hours, how do you communicate or, or, or work with the parents involved? I mean, is that something that you generally always let them know, or is it just at a certain level, or how are parents involved in your work? So in, in my, it, the way that I do it out here, the way that the counseling team at Capital City works is a parent is always involved if a child is going to have, um, I'm sorry, a parent is at least notified. They have to okay. get permission if the child's going to be receiving, you know, short-term counseling. And short-term counseling is usually offered for four to six weeks. At that point, if we're not able to make, you know, sufficient progress, I would make a referral out to an outside organization that, that could provide that more intensive support. But um, when a student, um, you know, when we're starting to think that a student needs counseling, I have a parent referral form that I use where parents can check off some of the concerns, whether it's, you know, ranging from, you know, low self-esteem to suicidal ideation to any of, um, you know, there's a range of 20 or so, you know, student concerns that a parent, um, you know, lets me know that they'd like like us to be to be talking about. Gotcha. It's really important for, um, you know, middle schoolers are, are very sensitive to, to what others know about them. So, you know, confidentiality is key. I make it, I make it clear to the, you know, to the kids that whatever they talk about in here stays in here unless um, there is a, you know, a concern about safety. So, so the rules are, you know, parents will be notified if there's a concern about, you know, their student being hurt, whether they're going to hurt themselves, or if, um, or if there's danger that, they're, that they would, you know, act out and hurt others. So yeah. I, I do keep parents, I keep parents up to date on, you know, what the, kind of what the basics are that we're working on, um, and definitely if they need an outside referral at the end of the six weeks. Um, mm. But parents are always aware, you know, it's important that a parent would know if their student is receiving, you know, mental health services. So. And then what, you know, we talk about, you know, like kind of the, I don't want to say more serious mental health, but something that's going to be really maybe a harmful to the student or, you know, really, um, you know, a serious enough to kind of take it to that next level. So what, you know, and again, most of the folks that were listening to this are professionals and parents and not necessarily students. So. What would you say are some warning signs that a parent would see if their child is in need of service, or that you would say, "Hey, if you're if you're if you're feeling this or you're seeing this, it's I'm the person to reach out, or the school social worker is the person to reach out to." Like, what would you say to a parent to kind of, especially middle school area, keep an eye out for? That's a that's a really great question. Um, you no, know, I've got I've got a couple different bigger things we could talk about, but basically, I mean, a parent knows their child better than anyone. A parent sees their child for, you know, more time of the day than, than a teacher or, or, or I or, you know, any administrator does, but a parent, you know, should look for the fact or should look for, um, you know, certain signs, like if the child's feeling really sad or withdrawn, you know, they kind of stop talking, they want to suddenly just be in their room on their phone all the time, and you have to pay attention because that's kind of middle school, but, you know, if you notice a difference in that, if, if them withdrawing, Obviously, any kind of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, um, you know, they see any cutting, they talk about, um, you know, any other kind of self-harm. Um, if you have a student who is suddenly getting into fights, um, you know, physical altercations, any kind of other severe out-of-control behavior, um, any kind of, um, obviously, drugs or alcohol, that would be a crucial crucial thing. Um, in middle school age, we see a lot of... Um, not so much, you know, physical fights and, and um, you know, dangerous, like physically dangerous situations, but there's a lot of drama in middle school, and you will, yeah. you will hear that up and down the pike. And um, it gets to the point sometimes where it's, it's pretty serious because it has a serious impact on, on student self-esteem. So if you're noticing, um, you're hearing a lot of things about friendships that are, inconsistent so one day they're best friends the next day they're not you know that that's stuff uh, that can take a serious toll on um definitely a middle schoolers um you know functioning and, and whether they're able to you know to make the progress um you'll also notice i mean we have students with a, a variety of needs here you know including intellectual disabilities who don't even know um who who, who are still learning basic safety skills, you know, talking to strangers and, uh -huh. uh, you know, when to, when, when you should, you know, different health things for, for young girls, you know, dealing with their, their period and their menstrual cycle. These are things that, that if your student is not 
getting, it's a great it's a great opportunity to reach out to the counselor yeah. or social worker. It, it seems like, and, and certainly as um, as you well know, I have two uh, a middle schooler right now, and I feel like as a parent too, you know, especially on the special ed side, is understanding kind of what's a big problem and what's a little problem and what's normal drama and and um, then other drama. And and I think I would expect too, at least I see it as a parent myself, that this is also a time where middle schoolers are just typically not talking to their parents or not revealing as much. So a parent may not be even getting that communication. Um, and so w do you help kind of parents understand, you know, if they reach out, like maybe ways that they can communicate better with their child or, you know, ways to maybe decipher, <laughs> you know, communication? Is that something you've ever do with your parents? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, you know, I definitely communicate, like I said, you know, I, I try to respect the student's uh, confidentiality and not get into every piece. But, you know, parents, parents will be aware of, you know, warning signs to be looking out for with their children. I, I really, you know, I, I want parents to know that, you know, especially with a student with an IEP, that parents are the crucial part of the team. You know, you know your child more than anyone else. And you have not only a right, but an obligation, you know, to be, to be doing, um, to be part of this team and to be, you know, to be working with everyone to, um, to help the child to, to function in, in a school. So, um, and also I hope that parents are, are easy on themselves and know that, you know, this is not their fault. <laughs> and, yeah. And, you know, I think that that, uh, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but, um, you know, it's it's a hard thing. I'm sure there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of meetings, and I I just hope that parents know that, you know, know how important they are. In whether it's a general education or a special education student, you know, parents can be on the lookout for warning signs of of crises, um, and you know, changes in emotions. But but parents, you know, definitely need to be part of those teams. Well, I think that answers, you know, one of the questions, as as you know, I, I told you I was going to ask was, you know, what do you wish parents knew about um, school social work and mental health? And it sounds like maybe that's the answer that, um, you know, to understand they just have to, one way or the other, they really need to still stay part of their child's orbit and, and uh, not be hesitant to reach out. But is there anything else that you, you wish parents would know about the work that you do? Um, I... Also, like I said, I, it, I I know that I know that a child will make monumentally greater progress if it is a collaboration effort between the, the family and the school. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really important that um, you know the parents in open communication with the school, knowing what kind of strategies are being worked on, so that they can reinforce that at home. Um, and then I also just I want parents to know that you know whether it is a school that has a formal social worker, whether it's a school that, you know, just has a, a parent coordinator or, or even just a principal, you know, your school is a wonderful place to to start getting whatever you need. So there are some amazing schools in D.C. that even have health clinics. Um, you know, you can get what you need by asking someone in your building. And, you know, I take very seriously and, you know, part of job descriptions of a school social worker is to help to link families with what they need in the community. Um, and so that is something I hope that parents, you know, ask for. Um, I, yeah, I hope, I hope that that's the case too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think sometimes, you know, and this is one of the reasons we do these calls and hope there are these recordings and hope that they get the word out is just even for um, parents to understand kind of what the role is. And, and if you better understand what you were doing as a school social worker, you can kind of go, oh, this might be someone, this is a safe place to go. And I, I kind of think that great social workers like you in schools can be that great place safe place to go to when they may, because sometimes it is a parent um, maybe not feeling the love from their their student teachers, and that might not feel like a safe place to go. So having that person be the, the, the safe place is good. And I'm watching the time. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Um, Lindsay, I want to um, highlight, we're going to go on the screen. You had sent me a couple of resources, and I'd love for you to just kind of um, Tell everybody what those three, I put the three resources on there. Um, uh, I just combined one, the, but if you can talk a little bit about the DCPS and uh, school mental health team and um, what folks should do if they're in a charter still, still or, um, as well. Thank you. 
Yeah, sure. So um, I'm not sure, Molly, were you able to – let me see. Yeah, so that link right um, – Oh, I guess we didn't attach it. I can send it to you, Molly, and you can put it out um, wherever it works. But um, DCTF has a wonderful kind of one-pager about what school social workers are trained to do. Um, and it just gives kind of a, a basic outline. You know, it's something you can just put on your refrigerator if you want to and just say, oh, my That's gosh, you know, my child won't go to school. I need help with attendance. I need help with, you know, school refusal. I need help because we are on facing homelessness because we are, you know. So whenever you have those kind of major life stressors, just look on your refrigerator and know that that's what we know that you have somebody there, you know, the next day, whenever you, you know, whenever you show up to that school building, you've got someone who's going to, who's going to give you some direction. Great. Um, we can, I've got, you did send that. I wasn't able to put it on the PowerPoint, but we will, for folks wanting to see it, we will put that on the AJE website next to the recording of this webinar so that you'll be able to link to it. So we will be able to find it there. Okay. Great. Um, and then the other two, um, the other two um, links and, and resources are just great um, places to go to. Well, I'm sorry. I guess the, the first one, the John Hopkins Center for Adolescent Health, is an amazing um, website, and it's a really great resource. They actually have a network where you can join and you can communicate with other parents who are facing similar challenges or, or just kind of need. Um, it, it's a great place to get ideas, to get resources. You know, it is a national um, network, so it's not something that you're going to get that specific to DC. But it's probably just a nice, nice chance to, you know, talk to other parents who are coping with some of this. Um, it's and you know, folks can offer other resources. So that website there is also really helpful. Um, and the um, the book that's post, that's posted down there again, particular to middle schoolers and to teenagers. But it's really about the adolescent development. Um, it gets to some of the health issues, the, the physical health issues as well as the mental health issues. But for that um, particular resource, I love how it talks about the puberty and the emotional and the hormonal changes. And it, it really gives some good strategies that parents can use to help to cope with their child's development, especially if they're having challenges um, with with kind of navigating or with with connecting with their children around it. Oh, that sounds really good. So that's really helpful, and I think for, um, you know, really the focus, is because your work is there, is that preteen and teenager uh, piece, so having both of those resources for folks. As we have we say during this part of the Special Ed uh, Thursday webinar, we always, we don't want to inundate people with like 82 places to go, but it's just two, you know, two or three other places to just try to get a little bit more information or have that contact if, you know, as parents are walking through this piece around mental health and, and social work. And, um, you know, certainly I've been experiencing and seeing uh, in personally the mental health issues, but also you see it so much more during the teenage, and it certainly seems the message is, you know, just always ask for help, always reach out, and it sounds like, um, as I expected, that um, a school social worker is really a great place to start, and, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we really appreciate having you on, Lindsay, and hopefully we can Thanks. do another topic. You gave us a couple other ideas for uh, maybe the fall that we can do on um, a couple other topics. <laughs> great. And I, I hope that parents, you know, all parents, again, especially parents with disabilities, know that they have, you know, they have a right to have their children's, you know, emotional and behavioral needs addressed, whether that is, you know, basically um, whether it's, it's meeting services in school or, or helping them to get them outside of school. So um, don't be afraid to ask your school for, for support. That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm going to uh, stop the recording. And uh, before I do, I wanted to let you know that our next topic. Remember, we do these every other Thursday, so the next one is May 18th. And we're actually going to have um, Elizabeth Riani, who is the Child Find Manager for Early Stages here in D.C., and talking about the transition from OSSI Early Intervention, which is the if your child is between the age of zero and three years old, to Early Stages, which is um, three to five years old. It's called uh, Part C to Part B. That's the federal law. But we're going to just talk about that process and what it means to folks here in D.C., very D.C.-centric. So please join us on Thursday, May 18th, same time, uh, 1230, and we'll do it for a half an hour. And this recording should be on our website, the one, our talk with Lindsay here today uh, by the afternoon. So thank you very much, Lindsay, and uh, thank everybody else for listening. Thanks, Molly. Have a great day.